All right. Hello, young scholars. Mr. Martyr on here. Uh, we didn't get to it in class, so we needed to create a flip video uh, just to keep things moving along. So in your notes, here is the flip guide. We did a little bit of the background. So I'm just going to pick up where we left off with why is this the Middle Ages, and we'll progress from there. So just recapping, so if you have this in class, or if you got this in class, this is a little bit redundant, repetitive. Um, the big thing that I want to touch upon is the characteristics of what makes this the Middle Ages. And we said there was a decline in trade, decay in cities, there was no law and order, and the common person does not travel. So therefore, life experiences really don't go beyond uh, the villages and towns where people lived. Decentralized government meant cultural isolation, and people had very poor living conditions. Um, and... and in addition, there was also um, very inefficient agricultural production. Uh, there was also, we said in class, a mini ice age, which made uh, production of crops um, pretty poor for some of the villages. So again, compare this, you know, when we're thinking Middle Ages, think back to what life was like for the people of classical Greece and Rome. People don't have the free time to ponder life's questions uh, like Socrates did. So there's not going to be that idea of wisdom and art and culture that really thrived in ancient Greece and Rome. All right, another thing that was really big and really uh, kind of categorizes and sets the Middle Ages apart from the other time periods that we've discussed is the bubonic plague. The bubonic plague is the bacteria Yersinius pestis, and this is believed by historians to begin in China, and it reached Crimea, which is the European border of, of Europe and Asia, around 1346. Uh, a lot of people at the time didn't understand exactly what this was. They didn't have the science and medical resources that we have today. We now know that uh, plague started from the fleas that were on the rats that were on merchant ships, and gradually those fleas would jump off and land aboard uh, unsuspecting people, bite them, and infect them and inject them with the bacteria. And it is estimated that anywhere between 30 to 60 percent of Europe's population uh, is decimated and destroyed. Uh, and it takes roughly 150 years for the European uh, population to kind of rebound and, and regenerate after the plague hits. Now you have to ask yourself, why could the plague be a good thing? And one of the most common things that we'll see is as people are dying because we saw uh, in the previous slide the discussion of the, of the mini ice age and the scarcity of food. Now that people are dying, there's going to be a little bit more food. There will be a surplus of food for people. So in essence, we know the plague is bad, but it also can be uh, a positive thing when talking about uh, regrowth. Here is a very famous painting. This painting was done during the Renaissance, but it's a very classic uh, depiction of medieval times. Uh, this is called The Triumph of, of Death, and this painting uh, will show it in class, but again, it depicts just really the grim horrors of medieval life and just death destroying uh, local towns and villages. I don't want to get too much because I want to be able to have a conversation about this painting in class. Um, so we'll take a look at that, and we'll definitely look at this on the smart board uh, at our next class so we can see it and discuss the various elements of it. And those of you that are grossed out, this is what plague looks like. This is uh, bubonic plague. It's characterized by uh, the destruction of the extremities, the fingers, and the nails. And what happens is the infection causes the skin to boil over and, and create lesions and pus, and it opens up the skin. Now this was bubonic plague. What ends up happening is that there is a mutation in this bacteria, and the bacteria then spreads to the victim's lungs. And what you're looking at here, this is a mass grave of plague victims. And I'll talk more about that in just a second. But what ends up happening is that as the bacteria mutates, it becomes airborne, meaning plague will spread twice as far, twice as fast, and in half the time. So it becomes very, very deadly. And scientists and archaeologists in this uh, scene are actually exhuming the victims of plague, and they're trying to determine their cause of death. Was it bubonic plague or was it pneumonic plague? But as you can see in this mass grave, uh, and I think this is Avion, France, uh, in this mass grave, people were so quick to 
destroy and, and dispose of the bodies that there were no proper burials done during this time period. All right, and this just shows you this map just shows you the, the uh, path of uh, the plague. We believe it started somewhere in Burma in South uh, Southeast Asia, progressed through uh, Genghis Khan's empire in China, and then traveled along the Silk Road into the Black Sea, into Crime Crimea, down by Greece, and then the merchant ships uh, across the Mediterranean uh, bring it through Europe. Again. Notice, ladies and gentlemen, it follows a certain latitude as I'm dragging the mouse across the computer screen. Just like those early civilizations were all found along similar latitudes, the plague also followed that same latitude. So it was inevitable that each civilization was going to be touched by plague. All right. And once plague arrives in Europe, it moves very swiftly. First in the Black Sea, 1347. Then to North Africa and Italy, 1348, Spain by 1349, and then it moves up towards England, Scandinavia, and Russia by 1352. As far as life in the Dark Ages, as we said, there was no more large cities, no more trade, no more scholarship. And with all these diseases, there was riots and starvation. Many people fled the cities. They left Rome, and they moved out and lived on something called manors. And these were large, self-sufficient farming communities that consisted of a castle, church, and a village of surrounding farmlands. I would make sure you pay careful attention to the word manor system. It's in red, so I would highlight or bold it. And I'd also want to call your attention to this painting here. Really unique. So we talked in class, and a lot of you guys had questions about how the sculptures and statues were missing arms and legs. Well, what's really unique about this is... They were vandalized. They were destroyed by these Goths and, and different tribesmen. So what ends up happening is these. this painting illustrates kind of the point. Here is a powerful uh, Caesar-esque statue, and it's being destroyed by a naked savage or barbarian as they destroy it, knock it down, and rip off its arms and legs. So again, if this shows you anything from the Middle Ages, it's the fact that culture was destroyed by these savage barbarians, as people would – as historians would record. So people flee the city to go live on manors, and in the next video, we'll talk a little bit more about the manorial system and feudalism. But for right now, I want to talk about the Catholic Church. If there was one institution that was quite powerful, it was, in fact, the Catholic Church. And during times of great unrest, people turned to the church as a place of refuge. So the Catholic Church was very powerful and very well organized. And usually a person who did wrong could beg for forgiveness and also pay for forgiveness, but they also must perform good deeds. So the church during the Middle Ages was very, very powerful, and they also possessed that skill of literacy. Few peasants knew how to read or write. The church possessed both of those skills. So it was not uncommon for people to go to the church. The church would be more than happy to educate those people, and in exchange, that person now became Christian or Catholic, so thereby spreading the faith and spreading the religion. Any feudal town you would take a look at had a church, and the only thing really that organized all these thousands of little feudal kingdoms was in fact that there was a church, and they were all members of the same organized church and organized religion. But there was no central authority during the Middle Ages. Not like we had during the Roman Empire. There was no great, great, vast empire. That takes us to the Crusades, and this is an amazing part of European history. So we said in one of our previous classes that the Roman Empire had broken into two. The western half of the Roman Empire was struggling while the eastern half was conquered by the Muslims and would become the Byzantine Empire and, and uh, fall under the Ottoman rule. So what ends up happening is uh, Pope Urban calls for a crusade, and this is basically the Christian church trying to retake the Holy Land. So for 200 years, these different crusaders go into the Holy Land in an effort to take back the Holy Land for Christianity in the name of Christianity. They fail. 
It's important to understand that the Crusades was not successful. However, when the Crusaders return, they come back with all sorts of different uh, viewpoints. They come back uh, um, with different viewpoints on how law is conducted. They come back with different clothes. They come back with different elements of society, different elements of culture. And that's going to have a tremendous impact on the people of Europe. So let's take a look. Here is a very basic map showing the path through Crusaders, beginning in France, then through Italy, and then into the Middle East to Jerusalem. Here is a, a fresco of Pope Urban, and no, he's not holding a gun. A lot of people think this is a handgun, but this is his calling on people for a pope. And here's a fresco depicting the knights. And this, when you think of uh, the Crusades, this is where you think of kind of the knights and, and the armor and, and the uh, Kevlar that the knights would wear, bows and arrows and crossbow. That's a, that's a Middle Eastern invention, believe it or not, not a European invention. So here's a really interesting map of the Crusades itself. It was not just one mission, but in fact several. So beginning in 1069 to 1099, the first crusade lasted three years. It set out uh, to invade uh, the, north, the southern part of Turkey. It failed. It is almost 100 years before the Second Crusade, which was 1147 to 1149, is launched. Again, following the same path into the Middle East, it fails. 1189 to 1192, the Third Crusade goes through the Mediterranean. They fail. The Fourth Crusade from 1202 to 1204 is launched. They seize Constantinople for a small time, but they're driven back. The crusade of Frederick the Great is turned back. The crusade of Louis XIV is turned back. So there are many different crusades throughout European history in the early uh, to late Middle Ages, and they are all unsuccessful. The Muslims do a tremendous job defending their home turf. And we all know it's a little bit easier to play defense than it is to play offense. So the Crusaders are turned back. But as a result, when they do come back, they come back with all sorts of new materials, which can then be traded. And that's going to open up uh, commerce and trade when we get to the Renaissance. So the Crusades, don't forget about the Crusades. The Crusades is very, very important. And I would put in your notes that the Crusades is vital to the growth of Europe, which triggers the Renaissance, a direct cause uh, for the Renaissance, which you may or may not have an essay on at some point in the future, it is because of the Crusades. All right. Uh, I will touch upon this in the next video, but I will end with that here. So feudalism is a system of loyalties and protections. And after Charlemagne or Charles the Great's empire was destroyed, land became the main source of wealth. And Europe was divided into these thousands of tiny little kingdoms. Uh, so you had many little d different kings and queens governing, and you had many, many peasants throughout Europe. I'm going to explain the system of feudalism in the next video, uh, and I'll recap that. And then in class, we're going to have a little feudal simulation that we're going to try. So if you feel that I went too fast, please feel free to watch the video again. Um, you can download the notes from the Edmodo library, but please make sure you watch this video in conjunction with our video on feudalism and you are prepared for our next class, which I'm promising, hopefully, will be interesting, entertaining, fun, and educational. All right, ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for your time and enjoy your day.